welcome back to the studio. Today we're going to embark on a new project. This is uh, going to be a hummingbird garden. It is a block of the month or a full kit that is available from Urban Elements. It's one of the applique elements design kits. That means that the pieces are all laser cut out for you. They're already pre-fused with Steam and Seam 2. So what you see me using today will be actually be in your kit. Uh, what you will not get in the kit would be the background fabric. And I took my uh, kit to the local quilt shop and I picked out a couple Kona cottons. We have the sample on the website as you see it here, which is basically a, a white or cream background, but I wanted something a little bit different since we've already done that. So we're gonna be going upstairs, we're gonna be ironing my uh, two Kona solids. I got one for the inside and a slightly darker color for the border. And you can see some of the applique will be uh, present in the uh, border as well. So we're gonna be working on these in blocks, uh, one block per month. And so that will be one of the things we'll be doing. Um, I have, a, I think, a pretty good list of things to do this year. I have about 17 different videos that I have lined up. Uh, quite a few things that I haven't done before. So I'm excited about that. So before I take you upstairs, I just want to warn you, um, I'm not always the neatest person. And while I try and keep it very clean down here, it's not always so neat and precise upstairs. So we're gonna go ahead and go upstairs and get started cutting for our first month and getting the first block done. Let's go. Okay, now we're upstairs in my piecing studio. This is where I keep all my fabric and my mess. This room is directly above the alarm arm room that you see many times downstairs. Uh, some of the nice things about the room, I have this large cutting table and uh, another ironing uh, setup over here. My ironing table really is just a uh, men's tool uh, chip box top. It, it's a workstation. It has the butcher block top and the drawer underneath it, but it's a heavy metal and it sits a little bit higher. And I just made an ironing board to go on top of it, which you'll see in a second. Um, I just like it because it's really sturdy. I've had too many ironing board tables collapse on me when I was trying to iron something. Um, I guess maybe I'm just too rough on the table. But I like something that's a little bit higher and a little bit sturdier. Uh, also, you'll see that we have a design board behind me. My design board is just made out of either half inch or three quarter inch insulation board. I got mine from Lowe's. You can get it from Lowe's or Home Depot. And then over top of it is Thermalam. I know that sometimes you can find Thermalam and sometimes it's a little bit harder to find. It's very similar to batting, but I think it was used for making things like pot holders and uh, things like that. So it has a little bit of heat resistance to it. I'm not sure about that. But the nice thing about it is things uh, can stick to it when you're working on blocks in progress. But when they don't stick, I always use uh, pins. So this is not the quilt that we're gonna be working on, but it's a similar one, and I wanted to have something colorful back behind me as I started. The one that we're gonna be working on today is called Hummingbird Garden, and this is the complete kit for that project. And another thing that I picked up at the local quilt shop was just a container. This clear container is 14 inches, uh, square and I believe the blocks get cut 12 if I'm not mistaken we'll find out in a second but I wanted something to contain everything in while I'm working on this over the months because as you can see I'm constantly working on multiple projects and it's nice to have things contained otherwise I'll lose my mind uh, as I said earlier I took my kit to the local uh, fabric store and I picked up these two Kona cottons. Um, I don't know what the name of the colors are. I just liked the way they looked. This is going to be the body of the quilt and this is going to be my border. Now there are cutting instructions for the border in the kit that we're going to be doing today with the cutting, but I'm not going to bother doing that yet until I get to it, uh, just in case I make a mistake or I make any alterations along the way, I wanna make sure that my 
border fabric is able to adapt and the way to do that is to not cut it today. So I'm going to pull out my uh, pieces of the kit. Um, I have a nice color page here and I might go ahead and tape that rather than having it taped on the inside of this. Put it on the inside of my plastic. That way I can keep it as an identifier for this project. And it has a little bit of tape there so now I have my project box all ready to go. I can go ahead and take this piece out too. These boxes are nice for the kit to come in but they bother me a little bit in the studio so I don't really mind not having that um, as part of my stuff to keep track of. We do have one large block that is going to be the birdhouse here so we'll need to cut that block separate and uh, we don't need that at the moment. Actually I'm not going to need really any of the kits. But you can see uh, all of the pieces are pre-cut, pre-fused, and they're pre-selected. So what you see here on the front is exactly what you would get in your kit minus the background fabric. So I can go ahead and put all of these in here and just work on my cutting instructions. Now I have taken my fabric and washed it. I wash all the fabric before it comes into my house. I always enjoy reading these debates on Facebook pages about quilting, who washes and who doesn't. I will tell you why I wash. I wash because fabric shrinks and different uh, fabrics are printed on different gray goods. And even if you buy the same fabric from the same line, it could be printed on different gray goods because printers use what they can get their hands on. They try and keep it in the same arena, but they can't guarantee it. So you never know, even if you buy from the same manufacturer over and over and over again, what the gray goods was that they printed on. So different fabric shrinks at different rates. Also, commercial fabric is printed and never washed in the process. It's printed and dried, folded and shipped. Batik fabric, like these, at least get washed in the process. They get dyed and then they get rinsed and washed and rinsed and washed until they get all the wax out. So at least batik fabric is washed over and over. But commercially printed fabric is never washed and we always hope that it's uh, the ink is set. And I always see stories about people washing their quilt that they've never washed and some of the fabrics bled. One more thing that I just read today, somebody bought 108 inch backing fabric, they washed it and it shrank 10 inches. Do you really want one fabric on your quilt to shrink at a higher rate than the others and have everything pucker? That's not what I want. If you don't wash and you know you're never going to wash your quilt, that's fine. It's your decision. I'm just telling you why I wash. I wash everything. So I think we're going to find that I have more fabric than I need here. That's not uncommon. I know that I am prone to making mistakes and so I always buy a little bit more than I need. This looks like almost four yards so we'll see here in just a second how much it says I need. Fabric requirements. Back, the back is three and a half yards so the front is three yards. They call for a white or a light background and border fabric. So I had chose this light buttery yellow. I needed three yards. I'm guessing there's four here. So I'm going to go ahead, move the camera and show you just my little ironing. And then we'll get cutting on this. So I'm going to go ahead and tuck this in here. I won't need that anymore. And I will pull out the page I need for cutting. So let's get going. I'm slightly amused with myself how messy the background is, even though I spent probably a week and a half cleaning my studio. So imagine what it was like before this. I have my fabric spread out on my ironing board. Uh, this is just a Husky workbench 
or one of those brands of workbenches that has a drawer here that I use for things that are related to ironing like uh, starch, hemming sheets, uh, pressing sheets, and lint rollers, iron cleaner. And I made my own top. I cut a board. I covered it with wool, thick wool, ironing mat, and then I covered it with uh, just upholstery fabric that I liked. So I have my ironing station set up and um, people are always saying what kind of iron doesn't leak? Well no iron will leak if you don't put water in it. So I just buy a regular iron. This is a, just a regular shark, shark professional it says. Um, it's a shark iron. I have it on cotton. I thought I had it on cotton. And I'm, I'm going to let that warm up. But I just use water in a spray bottle. You get exactly the same results from your steaming if you moisten the fabric as you do if you have water coming out in the iron. They both steam. So if I am not using water, sometimes I'll use downy wrinkle uh, releaser. I just kind of like that. But uh, that's totally up to you. As I was getting the iron set up, I pulled out my cutting instructions for the kit. And what I realized is that the three yards that are required for the whole kit include the border. And I already know that I've chosen a separate fabric, so I don't have to use as much of this three yards of fabric as I thought. Well, I think I even have four. So I'm only going to iron probably a yard and a half, a yard and three quarters, and then we can go ahead and get our blocks cut. Of course my iron is taking its time to heat up. Now we're starting to see some wrinkle disappear. If they would only make something like an iron that I could put on my face and get rid of those wrinkles. One thing that you will also hear me say over and over is that I like to iron things before I use them. If I'm going to iron these blocks today and cut them, um, I will probably iron them again before I fuse anything on them just to make sure that they're perfectly flat. But especially if I was going to piece something, I would go ahead and iron it again. And certainly if I had to cut it again. You can get up to a half an inch in air by cutting shapes out of a wrinkled fabric. And then when you iron it, you find that your shape is a half an inch off. So I know a lot of people don't like ironing. It's one of those things like... I would say ironing, binding, math. These are some of the things that quilters don't like to do. But I've just find, and I know from my own experience, if I'm lazy and don't do something, the mistakes just compound. So I like to go ahead and take my time. Normally if I was by myself I would have music playing in the background and then time doesn't seem to go so slow. You could also have a podcast or something that would help pass the time. But now I just factor in all of these things in the process of uh, making a project. I know that I've got fabric coming in today and I know that I'm going to wash it. So I've already got my washing machine full of water because I'm not going to use hot water to wash new fabric. <clears throat> so I have my washer on standby with the lid up, waiting for the fabric to be dropped in. And I know that I don't need the fabric today, so I'm getting it ready for a project. And that way I know it's finished. Fabric does not get to come out and play in the studio until it's been washed. It gets all the sizing chemicals off of it. Just like in uh, 
elementary school. It helps get the cooties off of it. Keeps the chemicals out of my studio. And I think that is enough of ironing for this piece because that's all I'm going to use. So what I'm going to do now is fold the two selvage ed edges back together. I'm not going to crease it because I don't need a crease line in there. But this is just the way it would have come off the bolt. And now I'm going to lay this on the cutting table and get this ready to start cutting my shapes out of. Okay, we're back to the cutting stage. And uh, just a couple things. With rotary cutting, it's always a three-part system minimum. You have the rotary mat, which is a self-healing mat that you use to protect the surface of your tabletop. It also allows the uh, ruler to cut without damaging the mat itself. And it is gridded so that you could use it as an aid in getting precise cutting marks. Then you have some kind of an acrylic uh, ruler for cutting that normally has markings on it. This particular one has one inch grid and then it also has the quarter inch markings and then it's got dash lines for one eighth inch marking which is useful at times. And then you have some type of a rotary cutter. The rotary cutters always have a safety feature that the blade is not exposed when it's closed. And it's really good to get into the habit of closing it back when you're done using it. Um, people often cut themselves with their rotary blade by leaving the blade exposed and then accidentally putting fabric over it. And you're looking for the uh, blade and you pick it up through the fabric and it cuts through the fabric in your finger. Also, even if this fell off of the table and landed on the top of your shoe and the blade was exposed, this can cut through your shoe. So you need to be very careful, uh, very aware. It's a very powerful tool and it's very safe as long as you're paying attention. Also, you want to make sure it's always a sharp blade because it's a dull blade that causes accidents. So you have the mat, the ruler, and the rotary cutter. The first thing I'm going to do is come over on your side and trim up my fabric. I have my fabric folded as it came off of the bolt. This is the fold here. I always cut with the fold towards me and the open edges, selvage edges away. So just in case there's a pucker, the pucker has a way to ease out without causing a, a little jig zigzag. So I'm going to look where I have a solid line from one end to the other and I'm going to trim off this starting piece. Open my blade. I'm holding my ruler in place and I trim off that excess. Now this particular quilt has uh, requirements for three different strips to be cut and then we'll sub cut our blocks. We have two at 14 and a half and one at 17 and a half. So I'm going to use my ruler and come up to 17 and a half inches and make my mark. I'm going to utilize the marks on the ruler and the marks on the table. Uh, lining up with each other. I have one of my horizontal lines of the ruler lined up on the horizontal line of the fold. And I've got my 17 and a half inch mark. The half inch is lined up directly on one of the lines of the mat. So I know I have that in good position. And now I can clean, pu cleanly pull this piece away. Close my ruler or my bullet cutter and set it down. I think I'm going to move the camera. <coughs> so that we can see the next piece. Since I need two pieces 14 and a half, I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing. I'm going to mark my 14 and a half spot. Move the horizontal line of the ruler to the horizontal fold line making sure the ruler lines up with the lines on the mat 
and make my cut again. Now the last strip that I need to cut is a 17 and a half inch strip. So I will do the same thing. I will mark my 17 and a half inch. Horizontal line on the ruler with the fold line of the mat. And this is my three strips that now need to be subcut. This piece of fabric would have been the uh, size of the border, but as we've said earlier, I'm going to be using a slightly darker yellow just for an accent. So I can go ahead and fold this piece and keep it with my kit in case I make any mistakes with these blocks. Mm. I have my first strip. I'm ready to subcut it. I've got the cut line on the line of the mat and I'm going to do a clean cut at the beginning just to trim up my first piece so I don't have any selvage in it. And then I'm going to measure over after checking. I need two pieces that are 14 and a half. Because this is folded over, if I make one cut, I will have two pieces for that size. So again, I have the horizontal line on a ruler on my cut edge of the fabric. I have the lines on the ruler matching up with the lines on the mat. And I have my first two blocks for ready for uh, applique. Put this piece into the scrap bin. The next piece that I'm going to cut is a long piece. This would be for the birdhouse. And I'm going to trim it first just to get the uh, edges even and then I'm going to open it up. This particular piece has to be 32 32 and a half so I have my line my fabric lined up to one of my lines here my ruler is only 24 inches so I'm going to add on to the 24 again the horizontal line on my ruler is on the cut edge of my fabric I've lined up my half inch mark on the line of the mat to make sure that I have my 32 and a half and then I go ahead and cut that piece and now I can set it aside with my other cut blocks and again this piece goes into the scraps. I don't know what you do with your scraps, but I have too many scraps, so I always take them to my local guild and let somebody there who loves the scraps scrap away. I'm cleaning up my edge from the selvage. I'm going to do that again because I'm not happy. I had a little piece of selvage still in there. And now this time I think I have to open up again because I have two different size blocks that I'm going to cut out of this last piece.
The first one I'm going to cut is 17 and a half, and I've got enough space on my ruler to mark that. I have the horizontal line on my ruler on the line of the fabric. The fabric is lined up on the mat. I've got my half inch mark on the half inch line of the mat. And so that is my first piece. I can go ahead and put that with the blocks. And now I can do my last piece, which is 18 and a half. And because I did a half inch here, I can go on to a solid line on the fabric here. And just like that, I have all of the pieces cut for the main body of the quilt. What we don't have yet is the fabric that would be the inner border. They used a fuchsia in the uh, packaging sample. I'll decide that when I get to it. I might look at my color wheel and see how... Uh, make a choice based on that. But I can go ahead and put all of my pieces in my box. These scrap pieces I can go ahead and put in the bag to be donated. One of the first things I do when I get my pattern out, I go ahead and just give it a little bit of a press I'm not using steam here. Again, I don't have any water in my iron. But what I want to do is flatten my pattern out so I don't get any uh, wrinkled pattern distortion from the pattern itself being folded. And then another thing I like to do is re-iron my block just to make sure that there are no creases in that that might have emerged from the cutting process. And then I can go ahead and lay my pattern out. I think we're just going to stay up here today since we're already up here. And just as a pattern check, you should be able to uh, get your fabric pretty much laid out on the printed pattern without any problems. Um, you can see, should be able to see right away if you've picked up the wrong piece of fabric for your backing because it wouldn't match the size of the printed block. So that would be obvious right away. So I have my pattern in place. Now what I'm going to do is go ahead and just, uh, with the paper backing still on, lay out my pieces and make sure that I have all the pieces uh, for my kit. And then uh, we'll get to the next step. Even without using a light box, with this particular fabric, it's very easy to see through the uh, fabric to where the pattern is. You could easily use a light box if you needed to. I'm going to actually use the cover sheet to try and get the flower components into the correct position. Of course this isn't mandatory. It's your quilt. But it just helps if you're trying to get the placement exact. Some of these pieces, like here, you'll see that um, are compound pieces, and sometimes I will do those one at a time. But if they were slightly off, I don't think anyone's going to notice. This is kind of a fun uh, phase. You could have your kids help at this point with the paper still on there um, if they were young and help them 
uh, just sort of like you would a puzzle. Let them help you get your pieces in place. And then even after the paper is peeled off, because we use Steam and Seam 2, the components are completely uh, repositionable as you're working on the project in case uh, you have something in the wrong place. So some of these I'm really paying attention to the color and sometimes I'm not paying as much attention. If one leaf is here or there I don't think it will make as big of a, a difference. I think I like this one better here. And you can just continue on with this process until you have all of the pieces where you want them. But notice some of these are quite similar, like the bottom, the base of this flower is slightly different on this one than it is on the other two. Also, all of these little leaves either curve to the left or the right, so you want to pay attention to those. And we just about have all of our pieces in place. I have one extra leaf that I don't see where it goes yet. So I'll just put that aside. So now that I have all of my pieces basically in place, now comes the part where we would peel the paper backing off of each of these pieces and go ahead and position it. Um, I usually don't have any problem in my climate. The paper peels off very easily and it has a, a stickiness to it. Uh, so it is repositionable. It will stick on the fabric until you get everything in place. And so I will just go through this process, removing the paper backing and getting those into place until I have all the pieces done. Now generally, I will do all of the paper peeling and then I will do the fusing. But if you were more comfortable, you could fuse each section as you come to it. Steam -a Seam 2 does require a steam component as indicated in the name. And as I said earlier, I don't keep water in my iron but I do keep a little mister bottle that has pure water in it and that's what I use for my steam component. Now also just to tell you if you ever have a problem like you want to protect the pristine edge of a circle or you have a piece that's a little stubborn you can score the back of the paper with a pen or a seam ripper and then fold it and that will pop open and give you a way to peel that paper from the inside out or in case uh, for some reason the paper was being stubborn and wasn't uh, coming free of the fabric itself. Sometimes I will pen through the fabric and the pattern just to help keep it in place so it doesn't keep shifting while I lean on it. And I've shifted it anyway. See, I can reposition these now that I've unshifted my fabric. And you can be as precise about this as you like. It's your block. But this is some, a wonderful thing to do. It's very meditative. It's nice to have something like this that could be a seasonal quilt that you don't have to spend a lifetime creating.
This laser cut and prefused applique is a really wonderful, easy process. I believe that it could be done with just about any age group, except very, very young. So it's something that could be done as a memory maker with your kids or your grandkids. And we're just working our way through this very quickly. If this leaf does turn out to be an extra piece, I will certainly hold on to that in my kit. I always like to have the option of having an extra piece here and there if I could in case I ever feel like something needs uh, one more little leaf. So I'm going to lay this into place and see if I can get this lined up. Some of these shapes are always a trick. Oh, there we go. So now I can go ahead and take that and place it on the leaf or the hibiscus flower. Trying to maintain that orientation. I'll do the same for this little one. <clears throat> now I can take this compound piece and get it into place and have the feeling that it's pretty much lined up the way it should be. Whenever there is multiple pieces stacked on top of them, I call them compound pieces. Okay, that's a tiny bit off, but I'm going to leave it. Now we're going to put the little, I believe that's called a stamen of the hibiscus. And we just have the lower half to do. We're doing this in real time so you can actually see just how long it takes. I'm trying to be as clear about the process as I can be. But it really does go rather smoothly. If for any reason you purchase a kit and you find that you're missing a piece, you can always contact support and we'll make sure we get that piece to you. As with any kit that contains multiple pieces like this, it's not unheard of for something to get mixed up or lost. But I also have to be very careful when I'm doing it. I always, uh, when I think I'm missing a piece, very carefully examine the studio. And many times I've found that I've dropped a piece on the floor and the piece wasn't missing. It just was lost in my mess. The last time I cleaned the studio, up here I actually had to use the rake on my carpeting because there was so much silk strands on the floor that I couldn't just vacuum them up 
I had to rake the floor first and then vacuum. I know I'm not shattering any illusions that you have that I'm a neat nick. Okay, so that's all of the pieces in place. I do have an extra leaf, so I'm going to go ahead and save that and put it aside. I'm going to go ahead and shuffle all of my little scraps into the garbage because I don't need those on the floor. But if you have kids or grandkids, maybe they would enjoy uh, playing with those. On the back of each pattern, there's step-by-step -step instructions on how to peel the paper and place and reposition. There's also uh, instructions for steaming. Now, uh, your iron will be a little bit different than everybody else's iron. So you'll have to make some determination yourself on how long you iron something. But one of the most common problems with a fusible product is that people do not fuse it long enough. They underfuse because they think that the fusing is going to somehow evaporate or burn off. And that's not possible. You can't overfuse steam seam too. You can burn your fabric, but you're not going to overfuse the steam seam. If you are the kind of person that would like to go around the edges with top stitching, that's your choice. We never top stitch our appliques. We only quilt over them. If they are fused properly from the get-go, they are permanent. And one indication that you have not fused properly is that you're getting a lot of gumming on the needle. That's an indication that that has not been fused properly, both with steam, heat, and time. So I just always mist my fabric a little bit, and then I go ahead and place over top of it a Teflon pressing sheet, and then I get to fusing. I use a pressing sheet for many reasons. One is it helps protect your background fabric and your applique fabric so that you don't scorch it. Number two, I have a tendency to do what you see me doing now, moving the iron without picking it up. If you do that with fusible web like this, it's very likely that you could catch the edge of your applique with the edge of the iron, scrunch up your applique shape, and then the iron's over top of it and you can't see that you've done it. And then as the iron's sitting there, it's fusing it all scrunched up. So the Teflon pressing sheet helps me prevent scrunching out my applique edges and distorting them. And uh, it just keeps the iron clean from the glue, keeps the background and the sides clean from any glue that might get on the iron. And I just try and count uh, to 15 or 17, depending on your iron and your heat, how long I need to, to fuse that material. Keep in mind with areas like this, that was a compound piece and the heat of the iron needs to go through the stamen and three pieces of applique and then to the background. So you really want to make sure with pieces like that that you give the iron a chance to penetrate all of those layers. And when I am finished, I always like to flip my piece over and iron from the back as well. I really want to make sure at this stage that I fused it. <clears throat> I know this part's a little bit boring, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut, cut the film at this point and then I'll show you when I flip it over. Well, that's the first block of our hummingbird garden quilt. We have the uh, completed block here and the paper pattern here. This is not a hummingbird garden. This is Zen garden, I believe. Um, but I wanted to have something colorful to hang in the background. 
I don't have the sample for this quilt in the studio, so I have a substitute. Um, one of the things I meant to say while I was placing the pieces on here, after you peel the paper backing off, the pieces will stick to the fabric, but they're not permanent yet until you iron them. And the nice thing about that is that you could hang the block up with the pieces not completely fused, just in position with that sticky back. And then you can stand back and look at your block and see if you've made the right background fabric choice. Um, I didn't do that. I didn't mention that, but I'm very happy with the outcome. I think the colors are popping on this very light buttery yellow. And so I'm excited to see how the quilt progresses. I'm always a little bit nervous picking out fabric for a pre-selected kit sometimes because I don't want to veer off too far in the wrong direction. But I think this upholds the pattern ideals very well. Uh, the color looks good. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but I always keep a big color wheel. This particular one is called Studio Color Wheel by Jenny or Joan Wolfram. She's an expert on color. But it's something that I reference all the time when I'm choosing fabric for a quilt. Um, they, I know that they say color does all the work and value, value does all the work, color gets all the credit. So I do also like to pay attention to value, but color is an important part of quilt making for me. It's one of the things I enjoy, the color play. So anyway, I know that was a lot. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time when we'll be working on block number two. I'm not sure which one that is yet. Um, I'm looking forward to the big birdhouse though. That's gonna be block number three. So we have something to look forward to. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for popping in. And thanks for not saying anything about my dirty studio. And don't tell my mom it's a mess. She's been on me to clean my room ever since I was a kid. <laughs>